What's up, Big Dog Nation? So, we have a very, very, very special guest in the house today. I get a lot of questions about injuries. You guys are always asking me about these injuries, that injury, people that got hurt last year, people are getting hurt now. And the only advice I have when injuries occur is I don't like it. I don't like when my players get hurt, obviously, on my fantasy team. But I can't really give you an analysis on how deep the injury is, what kind of impact it'll have. I have to go to other people for those sources. So I figured, like, let me find someone who does this for a living. Let me find someone who knows more about injuries than anyone else. And I'll be honest, I debated bringing Tyler Eifert on or Jordan Reed, because I'm not sure I can name anyone else that knows about injuries more than they do, but decided against that. And we got a doctor on the show. This is Dr. Jesse Morse. Welcome to the HQ. I know my audience is going to be ecstatic to have you on here and talk about injuries because like I said, I get a ton of these questions all the time. So why don't you just uh, kind of introduce yourself and, and let us know what you've been working on, you're doing in the sports industry and the fantasy industry in particular. All right. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Dr. Jesse Morse. I am a sports medicine trained physician. Uh, I live in Florida. Uh, I was family medicine trained and then I did my sports medicine fellowship training. I Past year, I took care of uh, a lot of the uh, major league clubs in Florida, including the, the Phillies, uh, who are based in Clearwater, and the Toronto Blue Jays, who are based in Dunedin, the town above it. I also took care of all the U University of South Florida uh, athletics as part of my fellowship. I was on the sidelines at, at games at uh, Raymond James. I did a, a ton of um, like uh, endurance events, stuff like that. Uh, when I'm not uh, at work, I also do a lot of uh, fantasy-related stuff and injury-related stuff uh, as part of the fantasy doctors. Um, I uh, cover a lot of uh, injuries, uh, discuss a lot of uh, things that come out kind of on the air. We, we try to catch it as soon as possible, like the dachshund injury that just popped up a little bit ago or, or, or whatnot. There's, um, we uh, stream everything in, in real time, so once it comes out uh, and it's a reliable source, we, we run to it right away. My partner in crime is an orthopedic surgeon at Duke. He's a foot and ankle specialist. His name is Dr. Celine Parekh. And then we have a, a big team at the Fantasy Doctors for uh, that help us out with a lot of the other stuff that are different types of doctors, whether they're um, physical therapists or, or uh, sometimes undergrad students and, and kind of everything in between. Um, we, uh, a lot of us are trained in, in sports medicine in some facet or another. Uh, Celine does a lot of these crazy surgeries that you'll see. Uh, he knows some of the top uh, guys, uh, foot and ankle, like Bob Anderson, who did probably half of the foot and ankle stuff you've ever heard of for any of the major guys. He knows him uh, quite well and then whatnot. So we uh, we stay plugged in. We are pretty much the only service that um, will give you a, a straightforward, honest, accurate, quick um, opinion uh, about an injury based on the information that's available, and we speculate based on our medical knowledge. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that intro. So, yeah, guys. Uh, I would highly recommend that you go follow Dr. Jesse Morse as well as the Fantasy Doctors on Twitter, um, and we'll plug the rest of his platforms at the end, but that stuff will be the first link down in my description. Um, so sounds like you got a lot on your plate and sounds like some really interesting work. I kind of want to know, so I'm starting an, a new series on YouTube, um, and it's more focused around the actual industry itself in terms of like fantasy football and the growth and the marketing side of it. And we're going to do a lot of player analysis here and mainly stick to the players. But I was intrigued because I know the first time that I ever saw like a doctor on ESPN with Matt Berry talking about fantasy football, I was like, wow, that's genius, right? I was hooked in right away because from the standard like sports fan, you don't know much about these injuries. Um, they come up and, and you feel a lot more I guess you feel a lot better about your players knowing when you actually what you actually know about the injury, right? Whether it's specific, what grade sprain it is or whatnot. Um, and I'm really intrigued by the fact that this is like a new market kind of, right? You're you're marketing yourself towards fantasy football, and I want to know like how did I guess the fantasy doctors really start coming into its own? What brought you into covering? You know, uh, obviously like sports are are always going to be a big part of covering medical news, but specifically, I thought you know being a fantasy football or fantasy sports doctor was like genius from a marketing and branding point of view because not, not many people have thought outside the box in that sense. So I kind of want to hear like your, your backstory and why, you know, why you took that route. Did it fall into your lap or was that like a, an, an intuitive thing that you thought was great for, for growth and branding? So, uh, a lot of the, the, the fantasy doctors brand itself, um, uh, a behind the scenes guy named Jeff, uh, and along with Celine, though the two top guys, who uh, started it and kind of developed it 
um, and then eventually got picked up by FanRag, which was just uh, kind of dissolved a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, maybe now. Uh, and some, they picked up some of the stuff, but not everything. So we're kind of on our own right now. But um, they basically um, said, you know, we need someone else that does a lot of the non-surgical stuff, which is what I do, uh, and, and, and somebody to help grow the brand. And that's where they invited me to join a year and a half ago or so, somewhere around there. Uh, and then we just kind of grew together. Um, one of the issues that I've always had, I've been a fantasy football uh, crazy guy for, I don't know, 15 years now, give or take, somewhere around there. Um, and then uh, I do fantasy baseball, which is 15 times crazier. Um, the, so, like, one of the things is, like, I know medicine because I've been doing it forever. But a lot of the people are like, I don't know what that means. Like, is it serious? Is it, you know, uh, is it to mean he's going to miss today? Is he done for the year? Uh, is he going to be okay when he comes back? You know, what? some people don't know the difference between a little knee bruise and what Dustin Pedroia had. I mean, you know, like, that's a big difference. Uh, Pedroia is out for the year, and he had a, a rare and radical surgery, whereas some people have a banged-up knee and they're fine. And then you have Sam Bradford, who just has a bone bruise, mm-hmm. But yet, the bone bruises take a year and a half to heal uh, sometimes, a minimum of six months. So uh, one of the other issues that I was having was the issue that Stefania Bell, who's very good in her own right, uh, but she's a physical therapist. She's not a doctor. Even if, even if she's a doctor of physical therapy, she's not an actual doctor. So that was part of the issue that I had is, like, uh, get someone who knows what they're talking about, actually treats patients. Um, and has the foundation and knowledge of uh, whether it's uh, orthopedics or sports medicine or whatever, if they're uh, medically trained, um, and then you kind of go from there. So there's about a handful of us, I'd say now. Uh, Pro Football Doc is probably the most famous one out in L.A. He's a, the former Chargers um, team doc, um, and he's been around forever. Um, and then um, there's a bunch of other ones that are kind of in the, everywhere. I think – what you guys are doing is has enormous potential in the industry because the industry itself is growing so quickly. And if you guys find that little niche spot where you become specialists, you know, that's that's going to be so big for you. And you're getting in early in the game, which I think is enormous. And uh, I definitely would I, I definitely will talk to you maybe off camera about branding options and how to kind of grow your brand, because you know, by profession, I'm, uh, I'm, so, I'm a social media marketer. So I work with a lot of e-commerce businesses and and uh, local businesses and stuff on how to how to build their brand um, and I'm doing it you know myself through YouTube as well so I have definitely some suggestions for you guys where you can get even more into the niche and grow that personally um, but thank you again for that background because that's something that that's super intriguing to me um, and I think you guys are definitely on the right path and it's something that people are people are definitely interested so keep keep doing your thing um, oh yeah and and speaking of uh, doing your thing I think it's I think it's time to maybe jump into some players yeah, and let me know who you want to start with. Cool. So I guess we'll we'll kick it off with the quarterback position, and I think the number one player on most people's minds is Andrew Luck, which is ironic since he's been off everyone's minds for about the last two years now. You know, missing so much time on the field, um, but now it seems that you know he is kind of rocking and rolling at training camp. All the reports seem well, but it's been such a long process to get him back on the field and throwing a football. So I want to hear from an expert on what you think his 2018 season might look like in terms of, you know, bottom of the spectrum, top of the spectrum. Um, is it like a mental game for him at this point? What's the physical game? And I know you went into a long podcast episode about this on your new podcast, um, which people should check out, but give me a, you know, top of the level kind of stuff on luck. So I'll, I'll preface it with this. A lot of what I do and what we do at the fantasy doctors is um, based on reports and information <laughs> from observers and reporters or stuff like that. So it's not like I have any insider info that I actually use. You know, baseball, I have had insider info, but I don't, I never used it uh, professionally. Same thing here. I don't, I don't have any, I'm just going on what we know Mm -hmm. and what has been reported. And and, and most of the time they're pretty accurate. It's amazing what different sports have different uh, things. Like, like in baseball, they will tell you it's a grade two sprain. He had PRP. He will be shut down for six weeks, like uh, Dennis Santana, for instance, the, 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 the Dodgers pitcher. Like, they told us exactly what he was going to do. But then you have something like hockey, which they, they tell you it's an upper body injury. <laughs> what the hell is that? Yeah. Like, there, there could be so many things that could be. 
So we only go by what we know, and, and now everything is available in like 10 seconds, I swear, which is crazy. So Twitter is my best friend, and my wife hates it uh, because mm-hmm. of that. But um, so if it's available and it's, and, and it's common knowledge, then I usually talk about it. If it's a niche thing uh, and, and I know about it from specifics, then I usually avoid it until it's mainstream, and then I'll talk about it. So for Andrew Luck, last year we had kind of, they weren't really saying anything, and, and then owner kind of Ursay said one thing, and that was chaos, and that didn't pan out well in the end anyway. But, so what do we know about Luck? Luck last year, um, he obviously didn't play at all. In July, he said, yeah, he's going to come back, he's going to come back. And then week one, nothing happened, and then, you know, nothing kept me basically the rest of the year. So Luck's 28, he'll be 29 in a couple months. So I always put age in perspective because a 22-year-old is going to heal a lot faster than a 32-year-old or something like that. So seven, uh, 2015, he only played seven games. So he's already been banged up. He's, the guy's never been truly healthy, in my opinion. 16 actually had a very good season, even though he was supposedly injured with the shoulder. So then uh, 17 ain't in the plane at all. So what do we know about this shoulder injury? All we know is that he had a throwing shoulder injury that involved somewhat of a labral issue. So the labral uh, issue, if you look at my shoulder here, it's deep inside the shoulder, and it allows your throat, shoulder to actually throw. So you can't look at it with anything less than an MRI with a dye. So I can throw an ultrasound on there, which is what I do in my day job, but I can't see the labrum. It's too deep, and it's behind bones. So, but the problem with the labrum is it, it's, a, it's cartilage. So it, it, once it's torn, it's not going to heal. So think of the car, look at the cartilage, and then think of it as a clock. So you have each section is a different type of cartilage. So baseball pitchers are notorious for uh, doing what we call a slap tear, which is on the top, like, um, 2 o'clock to 10 o'clock, that area. Now, some people have... Uh, bottom tears where they're more like three to or four to say six or seven and depending on where you're injured can obviously make a big difference now this is just a little fraying not a big deal if this is a huge tear then that's ginormous and that's crazy so that's my suspicion is a luck had a huge tear or a pretty big size tear we don't know where and eventually he played he played through it as much as he could probably got a ton of injections he got a, he was on probably a ton of oral steroids or oral uh, anti-inflammatory narcotics, this type of stuff, toward all shots, which we don't really use much anymore, stuff like that. But he he ended up having to have surgery because it just wasn't getting any better, and, and that's the only way to fix a labrum is truly uh, surgically repair it. So had surgery, I think it was like January of seventeen or somewhere around there. Everything went with a simple scope. It wasn't it wasn't a big a big deal physically. They didn't have to open them up. Usually, it's either um, just a little a scope like they do for the knee, or they'll do like a mini incision. Um, I'm not a surgeon, so I don't I don't do these things, but I I know about them. So uh, the problem with the shoulder is it doesn't heal well. It sucks at healing. Uh, even if a 20 year old sucks at healing. So any and if you if you bang your knee and you get a bruise and you let it heal and you let it feel better for a couple weeks, that's fine. The issue with the shoulder is you can't do that. If you baby your shoulder for too long, you'll get something called frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis, where the the bone actually literally sticks to the capsule. So it's like a balloon around the joint. That's basically what happens, and, and it, it locks. So some people who have really severe adhesive capsulitis get stuck at like this. Like like literally, they can't move higher than this. So you should be able to go all the way up here. But, but some people who have that... It takes six months to a year to finally get up here. My suspicion is Luck kind of dilly-dallied throughout his rehab, and then he developed this. They haven't said this, but based on what I was hearing, the fact that he can't throw, that's what's making me think of. Um, We know he went to Europe uh, last uh, year, I think it was October, November, for like, I don't know, a month of rehab. We don't know what he had done there. Probably... um, something called Regenekine, which is basically like altered stem cells, which is illegal in America, but you can do it in Europe. Um, but either way, when he came back, he did a lot better. So whatever they did there, which they haven't told us, is much better than now. So he did comment saying um, that he was getting everything in his shoulder balanced. Uh, Ian Rappaport uh, commented on that. So, but um, so but that was in November, and so, he's been doing good 
kind of ever since. Go ahead. So, yeah, so and a lot of the reports that are coming out now, Andrew Luck is saying he's completely pain-free. So are you saying that because his, his range of motion is limited, he could still be pain-free but not have a full range of motion, which would physically limit him? So Does that make the sense? Uh, range of motion is correlated with the pain. Okay, okay. So the more the more pain you have, the, the if, if you have frozen shoulder, the more... Um, uh, the less range of motion you're going to have. So more pain, less range of motion. So you kind of got to break through the scar tissue. Think of it as almost like webbing from uh, like a spider web. But the problem is it's inside the shoulder and it's kind of stuck like like ice crystals. So you kind of got to break those slowly. And then eventually when you, everything's going smoothly and running fluid, then you get back to your kind of daily activity. So that's why they had to build them up slowly. But he even admitted that he kind of dilly-dally through his first rehab, which is why he didn't come back. So now he finally did it good, the second rehab, and that's why he actually made it to where he is right now. So, you know, in January he was working out with famous QB guys like Tom House and Adam Dadoe, I think is how it's pronounced in LA, strength in his arm, throwing motions. So he's going to have to continue to do this uh, day in and day out to make sure that he has the strength, the flexibility, the range of motion that he lost uh, at, with the surgery. Based on what I've seen from videos from uh, training camp, he actually looks pretty good. I mean, is the touch going to be there? Is he going to be able to put the velocity on the ball? That remains to be seen. But as far as I'm concerned, he has the potential to be a t- top 15 quarterback again. Um, hell, he was doing this with a bum shoulder, and he was like a top 15 quarterback. So imagine him like when he doesn't actually have a bum shoulder. So, I mean, it remains to be seen how effective he can be, but... I think he can be a beast. Okay. Um, especially if he has appropriate. Uh, so, uh, what happens if he gets hit and, and takes, uh, you know, uh, falls on his shoulder? Uh, can he tear his hip limb again? 100%. Is he more susceptible to tearing it again? Yes. Uh, what do they do? They basically put sutures, uh, uh, what I think they did, where they put sutures in, almost like a fishing line, if you think of it that way. It's really thick. Uh, but unfortunately, it's never the same as, as, as original. It's never the same as when he was, you know, 15 or, or the way God made it. Unfortunately, that'll never be the same. So we have to just make do. Okay. Yeah, so I'm, I uh, I picked Andrew Luck last year in my draft because he fell. People were so scared of him. We draft like two days before the, fan, uh, the NFL season kicks off. So we knew at that point, we were like, there's a good chance he's not going to play or at least he misses eight months or eight weeks or whatever. So I ended up getting him like two rounds before the last round, knowing that I can keep him this year for uh, a round before it. So if I wanted to keep Andrew Luck this year, I'd be giving up like a 14th round pick. Um, so the, the number that, brilliant. yeah, the you, number you, that you kind of, that really well. Yeah. So the number that kind of stuck out to me there though, would you say you think he can come back and be a top 15 quarterback? I'm worried that the people in the fantasy community are expecting the 2014 Andrew Luck, if that's the year he kind of blew up and, and put up those like top three numbers. So you'd say, to people that are drafting him, thinking that he's automatically going to get back to that spot to kind of break the pump, uh, pump the brakes a little bit. So, so here's the thing: reviewing all of the QB uh, data and, and projections and everything, um, I think there's like 24 quarterbacks that could easily be all in the top 12 when it's all said and done. So, I mean. If you told me that everybody hates Cam Newton, but the guy's like always a top five quarterback, depending on how you play your league. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, Brady is like father time. Like, I'm I'm from Massachusetts, so I'm I've been a Brady fan since I could no you know more. basically I'm, watch the games when I worked there. there but a, like, as a Falcon so fan. like Locke, um, yes, he can be top five, uh, but it, it depends on how it plays out. How is the O line? How is his wide receiver? Does he get injured? You know, that type of stuff. Like, there's a lot of different moving parts that, you know, does he have the potential to be a top five? Oh, yeah. Does he have a, a potential to re-injure himself and miss half the season? Yeah. I mean, I kind of put his re-injury risk for his shoulder about 20%. Okay. As long as he's um, rehabbing appropriately, doing all the right things. Okay. Makes sense. All right, cool. Thank you for that info on, on Mr. Andrew Luck. I'm still feeling pretty good about getting him late in my late in my draft. Um, let's move on to oh, another yeah. another quarterback. That's Derek Carr of the of the Oakland soon to be Las Vegas Raiders, um, and I came into the season with an absolute no touch rule on Derek Carr. There was no way I was drafting him because you know he he had that monster 2016 season, fell off dramatically 2017 season, and I was immediately down. I'm like, there's no way 
that I could draft him when, like you said, the quarterback position is so deep. There are so many guys I'd rather have ahead of him. And now I'm thinking, like, maybe the injury that he had last year, I, I'm not even sure exactly what it was. You could probably touch on it more, uh, affected him yeah. on the field more uh, more so than I thought. And maybe I should kind of uh, move him up my rankings a little bit because he showed us some really, really good quarterback play back in 2016. So can you talk about the injury um, and, and if you think that really affected his play in 2017? So there's a lot of different pieces to this. So the thing about Carr is that um, he he actually had, I, I was looking back at his numbers when I was uh, prepping for this, and I was like, oh, I don't want anything to do with him. I don't want to touch him. That's kind of like what well, Jordan Reed, like kind of the same thing. Right. But when I look at his numbers, I'm like, damn, he actually had a very good season in 16. I mean, it wasn't, you know, Tom Brady or friggin' Aaron Rodgers, but it's it was close. very respectable. He had almost 4,000 yards. I mean, he had 28 touchdowns. Excuse me, touched down six interceptions. That's a fantastic ratio. He's not a runner, so I don't worry about it for that anyway. But um, fantasy pros, I have a tendency to use because their projections are pretty good. Uh, they have met twenty one going into the year. That's not bad. It's you know, it, could it be twelve? Maybe. But I, I, you know, personally, I won't be drafting him. I'll tell you that from the start. So what happened to, to Carr last year? So he injured his back in week four. What did what did he break? What did he do? So this is this. Same injury that Tony Romo had. I'll start with that. Okay. So in your back, you have your spinal call. Then each on each vertebrae, uh, the vertebrae are, are like this. They're thick like this. My suspicion is it was at the lower back, the lumbar region. So each uh, on each vertebrae, you have uh, bones that come out to the side, uh, and those are called transverse processes. So what happened was on one of the transverse processes, he broke the middle of that process. So, um, it, it, but the, for the most part, it's actually not that big of a deal. It sounds scary, but it's actually not that big of a deal. So it's usually about a two to six week return to play. Okay. Uh, Carr came back in one week. He didn't give it time to heal. So he just basically said like, I don't know, last week or a couple weeks ago that the, the injury that I suffered in week four on my back lingered throughout the rest of the season. It, he literally admitted to that. And I'm not surprised. He didn't allow it to heal. All these athletes think they're freaking superhuman, and they think they, they don't want to listen to our timelines and say, you know, this is two to six weeks. You can come back in a week, but you may not be very successful, or you can wait and listen to what we actually tell you because we do this for a living, and we see this all the time, and then you can actually come back and be appropriate. So that's part of the issue. Tony Romo's injury, because of his age, opened the door for Dak Prescott, and that was all she wrote. But most commonly due to a direct hit, which is basically what happened to him, painful. They cause inflammation, causes damage to the surrounding tissue. Uh, but the treatment is pretty straightforward. Rest, ice, sometimes heat, uh, some pain medicines, sometimes muscle relaxers. Uh, but if you, you don't want to lay them up too long because that ends up being counterproductive. So, like, most patients, studies show after 16 days, are able to walk and be normal, and most of them return to work within two months. Luck returned, uh, uh, car returned within a week. Like, that's not enough time. So, uh, I think he'll be, does he have a chance to be a 2016 version? Yeah. Is the injury going to haunt him again? No. I mean, I, I think he'll be all right. I mean, he's got a, a lot of weapons. He's got Marshawn Lynch. He's got Amari Cooper. He's got Jordy Nelson now. He's got Martavius Bryant. I mean, he's got Cook, who I really like this year. So, they have a top 10 offensive line. So, that hopefully will help them. So this offense has the potential to make some noise. Okay. Um, am I scared <clears throat> of him because of his back injury? No, not really. Not not particularly. Okay. So you think that that because he came back early last year and it lingered, that could have been a main reason why his production fell off. And that shouldn't be – you can't really hold that against him looking at his 2018 projections. Correct. Okay. I mean, I think he's a great QB2. I would not draft him and think he's going to be a top 10 QB. Okay. That's uh, reaching, in my opinion. Okay. I think Andrew Luck has a better chance of being a top 10 quarterback than David Carr. Okay. Or sorry, Derek Carr, David's brother. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the only two quarterbacks I sent over your way. I did see you post something about Aaron Rodgers recently. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to go into that quickly, because I was under the assumption, you know, he's been through the, I think the collarbone, he'd been through it. Um, so I assumed it was just like good to go for next year. 
But I saw you saying that with it being so deep, there was no way that you were going to be drafting him on any of your teams. You want to touch on that like really quickly? Is that an injury concern or just like the the risk factor no, overall? While it's uh, so deep? a couple things, um, I think uh, Rogers can be a, it will be a top five quarterback. Mm-hmm. I think he's gonna we gotta wait for his accuracy to come back. I think that'll be the last thing that comes back. His strength's there. I don't have a concern about that. Um, he basically broke the, the clavicle, the the, the, the collarbone. And it's funny because in 13, he broke the other side, non-throwing shoulder, and then this time he broke the throwing shoulder. Um, came back, had a pretty good game when he came back. Um, but he, his accuracy was out. He, 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 I think he threw uh, three interceptions for like the first time in like eight years or something. So um, the problem with uh, Rodgers is that people have a tendency to reach for him. Okay. With the quarterback class being so deep, I, I'm not reaching for him, not because of injury, just because there's so many other guys okay. that I like. And running back, it's really thin pretty quickly if you start reaching for quarterback. So I'm not reaching. I'm not getting quarterback until seventh, maybe eighth round. Uh, and you can even sit to the ninth, tenth, and get someone like Rivers or Ryan and be pretty comparable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, w- I was just confirming that it wasn't an injury concern that like most people weren't aware of or anything. But yeah, that's a that's the same no, strategy no. I think I most mean, people have, and I would stay away from. He's got two plates and thirteen screws, so it, it, the odds of him breaking that. Call the vote again. Are almost impossible. Okay. Like, I mean, it would take some serious, you know, force to break that again. At okay. least the same one he, one he just had done. Okay, cool. Well, I think that's going to wrap up the quarterbacks right now. So we're going to jump over to the running back position. And this first guy that I want to talk about is someone I can't wait to hear about him from a medical standpoint because I have Leonard Fournette ranked as my I think sixth or seventh overall player on my board this year. And I think the only, the, the single red flag I have with Fournette that everyone continually points out to me is the fact that he has a history of chronic ankle issues and, and lower leg injuries. Apart from that, I see a guy who the Jaguars want to feed. There was only two guys last year that had more carries per game in Zeke and Le'Veon Bell. He was not a zero in the passing game like a lot of people assumed. Uh, he, he was on pace to, I think, catch maybe 45 passes or something like that. Definitely not a zero. He uh, was tremendous on the goal line, got a ton of goal line carries, was tremendously used in the playoff games. He averaged about 25 touches a game in the playoff games. They have an incredible defense that's going to set them up on the goal line for a ton of touches, a ton of scoring opportunities on a team that wants to hide their quarterback with an upgraded offensive line. They were good last year. They surprised people, and then they went out and signed the all-pro left guard, Andrew Norwell. So I see zero downfalls in taking a guy in Fournette whose volume floor is so high because in redraft you chase volume in dynasty you can chase efficiency all you want if you don't like a player that's fine but if he's getting the volume (coughs) you don't avoid that in redraft leagues so my question is should i be scared of leonard fournette especially with these new reports of him dropping weight which i assume is a good thing when you have chronic leg issues so i'm kind of i go back and forth on fournette i've I've done probably five or six best ball drafts and only one redraft so far i mean it's august 1st um, how many leagues do I have for an Ed in zero? Um, but that may change. That's not because of I'm, I'm avoiding them. That's just the um, way it, it, it rolled out. Um, so here's the thing about Fournette. He has top 10 talent, top five talent running back wise. He, but, but here's the issue. What you've got to realize is that his ankle injuries go back several years. So the good news is he's never needed surgery. And, and, and reportedly, that was why some of the executives wanted to avoid potentially drafting him because they were concerned about his ankles, rightfully so. So, uh, you know, uh, let me pull up my little cheat sheet here for the specifics. I, got, I want to get make sure I get this right. Yes. So uh, in college, he an- injured his left ankle. Last year in the NFL, he injured his right ankle. So we're talking about both ankles. Not just one. So, and if you don't if you don't have your ankles, you're not a running back in the NFL. Yes, knees equally important, but you know. So obviously, it's kind of a big deal. So he's got a ton of ankle high ankle sprains, low or regular ankle sprains, uh, bone bruises. Um, missed six games at, in college at, uh, at the end of his final season uh, with a high ankle sprain. So he's he's got the recurrent issues. Here's the issue with ankle sprains. They don't ever heal like 
before he injured it the first time. There's mm-hmm. scar tissue laying down, but they will never be fully healed. Why? Because we don't heal ligaments. We scar tissue them. So you have, uh, I'll, I'll bring my foot up and I'll show you. So um, up here, so, uh, let me grab this. so on the outside of the ankle, can you see that? Beautiful toes, yeah. Uh, so on, out, on the outside of the ankle, we have, uh, here's, here's, the, here's three main ligaments right here. Really four, but we'll call them three. This is the most common injury in all of uh, athletics. The, the outside lateral ankle sprain, okay. super common. Then you have the inside ankle sprain, this one right here. This one is actually really hard to do because these ligaments are so strong, super strong. And then you have the high ankle sprain, which is the ligament that um, keep these two bones together. So the, uh, that's the one that uh, Odell Beckham injured this year, uh, last year. So here's the issue is that for net is going to have some issues this year with ankles. I almost uh, put money on it. Hmm. Depends on how long he's going to be out. That's the question. I will say as high as 75% that he will miss at least one game with an ankle injury. I'll say it's that high. Why? Because when you tape up ankles, it lasts about 10 minutes. That's it. After that, you you can throw it out. Guys hate running or doing anything with the bulky ankle braces. And ankle braces don't prevent injuries. They prevent a grade two from being a grade three if you were to have it on. That's it. So the problem is it's in the back of his mind. He knows his ankles suck. And, 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 And he can do, he needs to rehab like crazy. He needs to be very cognizant. All it takes is stepping on one player's foot in, in, in like in basketball landing on a foot or stepping on someone's foot and now whether it's a line whether it's whoever now that ankle gets tweaked and now it's angry and now you're going to ask him to run 30 times in a game five like 16 weeks in a row there's no way he makes it through the entire season without being on an injury report for at least an, one ankle maybe both and then he injured his quad, too, if you remember. You know, the, the four muscles on the top of your leg. So, unbelievable talent. I'm a little concerned about his, his ankle, hmm. which is why I, I think they're safer picks. Um, I think Bell is safer, even though they're starting to run him to the ground. I think uh, David Johnson is safer. I think um, uh, Elliot is safer. Um, and then you start getting into that six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and I think that's where he belongs. I think he's in the Freeman category. I think he's uh, Kamara is kind of up there. Can he be a hundred and two hundred a carry back? You know, Ingram's going to be out for, for a couple weeks, so we know he's not he's not going to be there to, to 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 take the workload. So, is he a top five running back? He has the talent. He has the carries, but is he going to be healthy enough to be a top five back? I, I, I just don't think so. I, I don't think so. I, I love for him to be because he would be. I'd love to watch him run. But if you look at the data from last year, um, the first six games, 4.58 runs per carry. Monster. Injury occurred. Yep. 3.22 runs per carry for the rest of the season. That's mediocre. That's replacement. Yep. That's how big of a deal it was. Yep. You know? So now he's he's fully healed. He's ready to rock and roll, but put him back in the pit and wait for him to get injured again. I, I really want him to be healthy, but I I I, I can't promise it's going to happen. Oh. It, it, ankle injuries are too common. Okay, so that's, that. and that's, you know, and then, and then you have this inactive issue. What is this? Like what? Imagine you know it was week nine, fifteen minutes. You're finally getting your star running back back. All of a sudden, pop up inactive. Yeah, DFS, I can swap him out. That's fine. But you don't have a replacement or a good replacement for him in your in your dynasty league or in your redraft league or whatever. You know, I play in uh, in, in semi big money leagues, not the several thousand dollar leagues. But I'm pissed if I have a good matchup and then all of a sudden he's not there and uh, he's not you know, and then every, his replacement is already taken. Yeah, you okay. know. Yeah, so you're so I mean you're definitely worried about the the ankles as a serious thing. So I guess. I guess I should probably be a little more yeah. worried, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't put him in that top group because I have the elite four running backs in the Zeke, David Johnson, Todd Gurley, Le'Veon Bell. 
in those top four, yeah. but, you know, it gets a little oh, yeah. muddy after that. I mean, they're all good options after that, but it's deciding, you know, it might be a make or break if, if you choose the wrong guy between Fournette, Kamara, Melvin yeah. Gordon, Freeman, or something like that. And I guess you want to kind of minimize, because you can't really win your league in the first round, but you can absolutely lose it if one of your first two round picks. David bust. Johnson, last year, done. Yep. That first was, game, I was done for the year. Yeah. I was like, seriously? Yeah. What's funny is actually my uh, my big money league, my we call it the E-Town Get Down. The kid who took David Johnson first overall ended up still winning the league because he went with like, he had Todd Gurley in like a third round and then hit on like three oh, other that, players. I was like, this was yeah, absurd. Yeah, that's uh, unbelievably lucky. Yeah. 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 Once I lost uh, Johnson, I was like, yep, yeah, that's it. Yeah, Done. that's I, horrible. I, the, I mean, it's not like baseball where you have a ginormous roster where you can absorb that injury. Yeah. And it's six, seven month season, so you're not going to probably lose it for the whole season. But then these guys, you lose the first or second round pick, done. Yeah. It's, uh, you, you just, it's not deep enough. Unless it's dynasty and you've, you know, accumulated guys. But, you know, I, I really want, so he, and here's the preface for Fournette. If you're drafting him in the third round, no brainer. Of course. But you're not, you're not going to get him in the third. That's the problem. So you have to pay the premium. If you're not, if you're, if you're, like last year, it was a perfect situation for him. You definitely made, made, you know, running backs do really well as rookies. Yep. Every other position sucks. So, like, stop drafting wide receivers who are rookies. Like, forget about it in your fantasy draft. Like, mm-hmm. yes, draft them on your fantasy on your regular team because you need them eventually. But don't depend on uh, rookie uh, wide receivers. So it's just they don't they don't do well, you know, in the first year. Yeah, that's like so, my, my dynasty that's kind of my strategies thought. for the most part. Um, so you don't think that, you know, all the reports about Leonard Fournette kind of coming in the league and playing at 235 last year and then him down to 222, 223, like 12 pound weight loss. And obviously those can be super skewed depending on water weight and how you, when you weigh yourself oh, yeah. on a day to day basis. Oh, yeah. So I don't read too much into it. But if he really legitimately dropped maybe 10 pounds of that is, is fat or something which it would be a pretty significant portion. Obviously, it's a lighter load on the ankles, but the way you explain the whole like sprained ankles and how they don't really heal, it almost seems that that might be kind of irrelevant. Well, I think it's a great idea. So I don't know where I read so much data that I'm, I never remember where it was from, but like if you look at like the top 25 backs over the past decade or whatever it is, I think they all played under like 205 or 220, whatever, it was some number. So they were lower. It's not like, you know... LeGarrette Blunt is going to be a rushing title guy. Like, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, it, it's much of a beast as he is. So getting to his lower weight will definitely help him be uh, more explosive. Will it help decrease the injury? Yeah, maybe a little. Um, uh, more so for the knee. But every one pound of increased body fat in the, uh, in the abdomen or over where he's over, it's 10 pounds on the knee. I don't know the numbers for the ankle. Wow. Okay. But so definitely will help. But... I, I, it's just the situation that they put themselves in. It's, he's what he's going to ask. I mean, the the O line is fantastic. I mean, they um, I, I, I fantasy guru lead is, is the guys I use a lot. Um, they gave him a B minus for the for the uh, the O line. So um, Norwell was ranked number three out of seventy nine. Mm-hmm. Linder, the center, is fourth out of a third five, um, and then Parnell, the right tackle, was twenty second out of eighty one. So like. That's a really high end, but the, the problem is the left tackle and the, and the right guard are both at the, at the bottom of their um, respective things. But overall, I, I think you know if you if you have them in dynasty, keep them. If you're drafting them in the third round, go. If you're drafting them in the first round, roll the dice. That, that that's that's my that's my that's my opinion. That's basically what you're doing. Yeah, you're rolling the dice. Okay, okay, good breakdown there. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Um, Next running back, I didn't put a lot of them on this list, but I'm interested in hearing more about Deonta Foreman because, you know, the research shows that this torn Achilles that he suffered last year is extremely difficult for a running back to come back from and successfully, you know, make an impact on their team. And this would, uh, this impacts obviously Lamar Miller, who everyone was kind of staying away from. And now we're maybe assuming Deonta Foreman starts on the pup if he ever, you know, depending on when he gets back and stuff. So, um, in your experience, I guess, you know, dealing with people who have maybe similar injuries or explosive athletes that have had these kind of injuries, you know, most of the reports are coming out pretty negative about Foreman. They have no idea when he's coming back, and the torn Achilles is just a, a brutal, brutal injury. So here's kind of a funny twist 
to this. The main research based on NFL players from torn Achilles from returning to play was done by my partner at the Fantasy Doctors, Dr. Celine Prick. He's the one who headed the article. Okay. So it's, this is his data. So I just looked at that, happened to look at it last night. So out of 78 players from 2010 to 2015 who had a torn Achilles, 26% of them never returned to the NFL. Jeez. One in four. Of those, the average of the ones that came back, the 75% that came back, nine months was the average return to play. But there was a net decrease in power of 22% and a net decrease in value of 23% over the three following years after the injury. So that's the general for all positions. Now, running backs saw a 78% decrease in three years after the injury in power and value. Sheesh. Done. Super common preseason, 58% of the time. Foreman suffered the injury on November 19th. Fast forward nine months, assuming no setback. We're talking mid-October at the best. Add in the fact that the Texans' O-line is awful. I want nothing to do with him. Yeah, he'll also be out of shape. He came into camp last year as a rookie out of shape, and that wasn't coming off a torn Achilles. So he'll take, yeah, that's a good point. There's no, uh, completely avoid Deontay Foreman this year, basically what you're saying. Yeah, and if you own him, sell him at the highest you can sell him. Okay. Uh, uh, the, uh, it's possible he comes back and is a monster, but the data doesn't mm. suggest it. Mm. Yeah, I don't know about you that. Know? You know, okay. I mean, with the seventy-eight players, that's a lot. That's a lot of uh, torn Achilles. Uh, it's not like we're talking about five guys here. Yeah. You know, and 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 eighty percent decrease. That's crazy. Yeah, that is that is a pretty staggering number. Um, and why? Yeah, why even risk it? I mean, obviously you won't have to spend any capital on them now, but it's almost like a wasted pick at this point. Pick a rookie that has, uh, you know, maybe Hines or or Wilkins or somebody like that who has a uh, potential to break out. Yeah. I agree. I agree with you at that point. So stay away from you not know, forming people. You heard it here. Um, and then you know I don't. Ha I didn't really have any other running backs on the list. I can't even think of any ones that I'm too nervous about going into um, going into the year. Um, if you have any off the top of your head, you can kind of chime in on them. Otherwise, we can move to wide receivers if you have time. You, you just you just kind of let me know. What you're um, David Johnson, um, green light. Okay. Should be good. I figured that. Uh, we don't know really anything about his injury. Uh, my suspicion is he had a PFCC injury, which is uh, this little uh, structure right here. Super important. Uh, can't fix it without surgery, hence the reason why he had surgery. We know he didn't have a fracture because they told us he didn't have a fracture, um, but they didn't tell us anything else. Um, the problem is... Um, he, if he takes another hit to that, I can't promise that it's going to surgically hold up. Mm, so is he a top five running back? Yes. He does uh, passing and running ridiculous. He, the guy's a beast. But um, can I risk the number one pick on him? No. Um, I'm, I would go with Gurley. Okay. Is he a top five guy? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's Gurley. Then you got Bell, uh, Elliott. Um, depending on how Bell shakes out and depending on how much they're going to run him to the ground. Yep. Um, and then how much, uh, and, and then um, you kind of go from there. Yeah. So he's, he's a top five guy. That's I'll, 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 I, have those, stop. I have those top four guys together in, in their own running back tier as the top four picks overall, David Johnson being the fourth of those four. Um, but, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not going to go crazy about it. I would, I would be okay with him as my number four overall pick because I want a workhorse back, and he has that sky-high potential. So, um, thank you for that input on David Johnson. Oh yeah. So and he's got, it, it, yeah, I mean, and, and his his um, as far as his quarterback situation, I'd love Sam Bradford to be decent this year, but he hasn't shown that he's been the best. I mean, uh, good segue. Uh, you got to remember that Bradford tore his ACL twice, and he's got a rookie quarterback coming in behind him. So, yes, sir. Um, I think they're going to kind of depend on him a lot, uh, Johnson, which is a good thing. You know, hopefully he stays healthy. The talent's there. We know that. Yeah, of course. That's a good point with Bradford because I, I'm I'm a fan of Larry Fitzgerald, as I've always been. I've been pushing him the last few years, um, and I'm a little nervous if 
if uh, if Rosen gets in at the quarterback spot because Bradford and, uh, and Fitz would probably go together perfectly just because we know we're, we're, we're Bradford likes to throw the ball. Um, Rosen definitely will push for that spot. If, if Rosen does end up winning that spot or if Bradford goes down, then it's definitely a plus for David Johnson, a minus for Fitz. The other thing is like that O-line in, in Arizona is pretty garbage. So I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about that for David Johnson in terms because you look at um, the, the Rams, you look at the Steelers, you look at the Cowboys, all three of those, those are, those are strong points for all three of those teams, you know, and that's just, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so that's, that's the running backs I wanted to cover, um, I'm thinking this is probably hitting almost like the 45 minute, 50 minute mark, and that's usually about how long I do my episodes, so we're going to cut it off with the actual injury specific players. And um, I, I wanted to ask you the wild card questions, if that's cool. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, and then uh, I'll kick off after that. Cool. So basically, you know, knowing what you know about a lot of these guys' injuries, and, and you dive into them more than the, the average folk, of course, is there a certain player that you might be targeting in drafts this year? Because maybe their value is dropping so um, so wildly, and it's because of his, you know, the injury that might have happened last year, or might have happened now in the preseason or something, and you're going to take advantage of that because you have, I don't know if you want to call this insider information or whatnot, but is there any, anyone based on injury that you see a great value in drafts right now? Um, and then vice versa on the flip Cameron side. Cameron Meredith. Cameron Meredith, I love that. I was, uh, I was watching some uh, video on Twitter today of him at camp. Yeah. He looked like a beast. Uh, hold on, I have a list of my phone. Let me pull up. Yeah, um, grab it, my man. So, um, Cook, Dalvin, uh, Sterling, Shepard. Mm, okay. uh, um, I like me some... Um, uh, Chris John, uh, Thompson had a setback, or is not going to be ready. So uh, I really liked him in my PPR leagues, but uh, you got to bump him down now. No more. So those Mike first, Williams. Those first three the, guys. Uh, the Chargers. Those first three guys were guys that you like because their value is dropping a little bit due to injury. Yeah. And what about uh, Mike, Mike Williams? Williams of the Chargers? Uh, I like him a lot. Okay, interesting. You're not you're not uh, nervous um, about Mike Williams coming back. I believe I haven't done my my tons of research, but I, I think he has the potential. I need to do a little bit more. I, I, I don't know all the details right now. Okay. So stay tuned for that, people. Um, and then Dynasty League, um, Henry is a good pickup. Yes. Do um, you think he'll be fully ready to go in, in 2019, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think he'll be fine. I feel like AC is a sneaky guy. Yeah. Um, if he can stay, uh, if he can be back and play, uh, I think we'll touch this uh, in another episode, but um, yes, uh, Eifert is definitely someone I'm grabbing like you grabbed Luck last year. Yeah, we'll hide the wide receivers and the tight ends for now. We'll we'll pick that up in the next episode, whenever that may be in August. We'll we'll cover those two positions. And, and I'm not touching uh, Beckham Jr. Really? And yep, and I'm not touching Watson as much as I love him. Deshaun. Yeah. And that's based on injuries, or you just don't like them overall. Um, the, the back, injury, the the one playing is... style, their offensive line. Um, but he, if he stayed healthy, I would have won every league I had in it because I picked him off the wire like every bit did. I think. Uh, yeah. Um, the kid was ridiculous, but um, but I, I just he's pretty high risk for a top five quarterback. Interesting. Okay, I hadn't heard anything about o- Odell being uh, kind of a scary pick from the injury risk. Well, obviously, it was a really severe injury um, when you watch the replay and stuff. But he was my first round pick in a lot of leagues last year, and that wasn't that wasn't fun. Yeah, I, I get a bad taste in enough about Odell, um, and it more so has to do with injury than it does his social presence. I mean, he kid unbelievably talented. All right, so I, I did a, a, the, the podcast on him already, and. Um, his injury risk is not as high as Fournette's, but I'd say it's about 40%, somewhere around there. To miss at least a game. It's pretty high. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, he, he had hardware in his ankle, in his leg. Um, he is stubborn. He wants to come back too soon, which is not good uh, mentality to have for an NFL player. Yep. Uh, because it, it leads to what happened. If he, I'll say this: if 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 
Beckham Jr. didn't rush his rehab and allowed his high ankle sprain to heal properly, he probably would have never broke his leg. I, I, I'll go out and let me say that. Hard to 100% know, as you can tell, but my suspicion is he didn't have the, what we call proprioception. Uh, he can't push off and feel like he did if it was 100%. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that was a big takeaway I learned from last preseason was not to underestimate those preseason injuries because people run back from them, and then you see it. You see, like, the DeMarco Murray last year. You see Odell, Danny Woodhead. You see it over and over and over and over again. It's just, even if it's not the same exact injury again, it weakens the other parts, and, and something else might happen, you know? Corey Davis. Correct. Another one. There you go. Yeah. Another one, you know, uh, tons of potential. That preseason injury lingered. He re-aggravated it, and that was uh, half a season at least. Yeah. And then he did, was out of sick, and he didn't go. That was it. Yep. Yep. All right. So those are your wild cards. You wrapped up the quarterbacks, the running backs. We touched a little bit on some wide receivers, but we're going to jump back into those um, whenever you can join me again. It'll probably be maybe the second or third week of August. And I'm actually excited to kind of jump into Doug Baldwin because we just heard about his little knee injury today. Um, yeah. And by that time, we'll have a lot more news on it, I'm sure. So we can kind of get more in depth on that. But um, but again, man, I want to say thank you so much for joining me. Um, and I guess tell the people where they can find you. All this will be linked down below in the description as well. So, so um, my Twitter handle is probably the easiest to reach me, uh, Dr. Jesse Morse. Um, I have my website, www.drjessemorse.com, and I have an email. You can uh, send me a message through there if you want. Um, I have um, my Injuries 101 podcast, which is uh, one I've been kind of referring to a lot. That one is player injury specific. Uh, each injury, each episode is a different player. Um, I've released seven or eight so far. I'll, I'll probably release another three or four this week, and then we'll, we'll, we'll try to do the rest of them throughout the rest of August, if I have time. Um, then the Fantasy Doctors podcast itself, uh, you can find us on Twitter or just go to the Fantasy Doctors uh, online. And the website's really good. Um, our podcast will be taping this week for Season 2, Episode 1, uh, we're covering all the NFL quarterbacks, Blaine and I, and we'll break them down. And we'll, uh, we have this cool uh, analytics department where they uh, take injuries in perspective. They take um, their uh, history of injury specific. They take their age, uh, everything like that. They put it into an algorithm, and then they give you a dependability reliability score, mm-hmm. like a durability score, and they give you a projection based on their injury of points. Oh, interesting stuff. So, that's crazy. It's crazy, yeah. So uh, that's debuting probably next week, uh, maybe this week. Um, so uh, that should be pretty sweet as well. Um, we'll be pushing that out over the next couple of weeks. So that's kind of what we got going on right now. All right, perfect. Yeah, so I will, I'll I'll make sure to put all that info down below. Guys, make sure you're following my man's Dr. Jesse Morris, because he'll be hitting you up throughout the season. You know, on Twitter, obviously, we have injuries every single Sunday, and he'll be the first to hop on those and let you know what's going on with your players and all that good stuff. Um, Again, thank you for hopping on and taking the time, uh, and we will get back sometime either early to mid-August. We'll link up outside of this face-to-face cam and, and figure that stuff out. But thanks again for joining us, man. No problem. Thank you very much for having me.